Hi there. So, Danganronpa is weird. It's like Ace Attorney on steroids. It's gruesome and intriguing and enthralling, and today I want to see where all of that came from as we journey through Danganronpa's development history. Oh, and before we begin, this video will have some spoilers. I'm not going to spoil the ending or anything too plot related, but I would recommend going into the game blind first if you can, then coming back here afterwards. Don't forget the coming back part. <laughs> It was the late 2000s, and Japanese development studio Spike had been working on mostly sequels and adaptions for the past few years. Wanting a change, they decided to develop a completely new game from a completely new series. Now, developer Kazutaka Kodaka had an idea for a visual novel game, so he decided to email producer Yoshinori Terasawa. The basic idea he had was a closed circle detective game, i.e. a mystery where all the suspects are known to the player. All the characters in his game would be teenagers, and they would have seven days to put an end to a series of murders. The name of his game would be either 15 Boys and Girls Killing Story or Our Seven Day Survival War. He wasn't sure yet. Now, Kodaka and Terasawa emailed back and forth a few times, during which Terasawa shot down both of his name ideas. After a few emails, the two settled on the basic prompt of Psychopop High School Detective Mystery. What is Psychopop? According to Kodaka, the idea of Psychopop is that things are gruesome and horrific, but there's this pop twist to it, the visual flair. And so Kodaka went away for a few days to put together a proposal for his game. And a few days later, Kodaka showed Terasawa the finished proposal. The game was called Distrust. The story? 15 high school students are made to take part in a killing game. At first, they thought they were strangers, but as the game progresses, they soon realise that's not quite the case. Ooh, very dramatic. Now, the game would be split into investigative segments and trial-like segments. During the investigation segments, someone would commit a murder. Then, in the trial segments, the player and the other characters would all vote on who they thought committed the crime. Whoever received the most votes would be killed in some kind of gruesome way inspired by movies like Saw and Battle Royale. Another game system he proposed was a trust or distrust system, which was also the game's namesake. When talking to characters, the player could choose whether they trusted them or not. Now, producer Terasawa liked this initial idea, but he thought it needed some changes. You see, the Japanese market was flooded with visual novel games at the time, so Terasawa told Kodoka to give his game more impact to make it stand out. After thinking it over, Kodaka decided to try and spice up the trial parts of the game, where you figure out who you think committed the murder. You see, in Japan, alongside YouTube, there's another major video streaming site called Niko Niko Doga. Now, as you know, on YouTube, people's comments are simply displayed below their video. On Niko Niko Doga, however, they fly across the video. Inspired by this, Kodaka changed up the reasoning system so that each character's statements would fly across the screen, and the player would have to think fast and select which of the statements was true. It combined the intellectual problem-solving of a mystery game with the action of a shooting game. In Kodaka's words, it's a deliciously evil combo that no one will combine. Except for him, I guess. That wasn't the only change Kodaka made to help his game stand out, either. You see, on reflection, his proposed game looked kind of similar to a lot of other visual novels, like 999 for instance. To contrast this, Kodaka decided to fully embrace the psychopop look, making the characters brightly coloured and dynamic. He also changed the blood's colour from red to pink, partly to make the game more visually appealing, and partly to lower the game's age rating. And so, Kodaka was finally ready to present his idea to the higher-ups at Spike. However, their reactions weren't so great. It's a PSP visual novel, it could only sell 40,000 copies max. It's not very unique, it just takes the good parts from other games. It sounds interesting, but the selling point is hard to understand. And finally, the response that depressed Kodaka the most? Lower the development costs and make it more unique. Oh dear, that wasn't the response that he had expected. Still, Kodoko couldn't bring himself to give up on the game, so he decided instead to make some major adjustments. First off, he knew he needed to cut out the visual novel aspect of the game, as much as possible anyway. He changed the genre to high-speed detective action, 
and removed any references to visual novels from the planning documents. Next, he reworked the game to fit this new genre. First off, he turned the regular old high school students into ultimate students who were each at the top of their respective fields. He changed the visuals too, from an ordinary visual novel style where you simply talk to 2D images face on, to a sort of 2.5D style, where 2D images are placed in a 3D world like cardboard cutouts. Kodaka also added some RPG-like elements to the game, such as skill and engagement ratings. Finally, he changed the name from Distrust to Execution High School and the Students of Despair. Right, after making all these changes, Kodoko was ready to present this new proposal to the higher-ups at Spike. Psychologically, this is unacceptable. It doesn't need to be so grotesque. It would still only sell 40,000 copies max, maybe even only 10 to 20,000 copies if we're unlucky. No, shut down again. Alas, Kodoko was not going down without a fight. He and his colleagues were all really enthusiastic about the idea, so Kodoko returned to the management team to try and change their mind. Surprisingly, they did. Hooray! Now development could go ahead. And so, the programmers got programming, the artists got arting, and development powered ahead. For the music, composer Masafumi Takada was brought on board. Kodoka instructed him to create something with some punch. Takada decided to start with the game's main theme. However, at the time, he was really busy with other projects, so in his own words, I just banged it out in 20 or 30 minutes. When he went back later to clean up the arrangement a little, he had a sudden idea. He would have his Max built-in robot voice say Danganronpa. And with that added, the main theme was created. For villain Monokuma's theme, Kodaka asked Takada to create a theme with hijinks, and Takada certainly delivered. The idea he had in mind was something like, we're all gonna die sooner or later, cha-cha-cha. Right, now it was time to decide on the voices. If Kodaka could have had anyone to voice Monokuma, he would have wanted voice actress Nobuyo Oyama, voice of Japanese anime character Doraemon. However, he thought that there was a 90% chance she would say no. Miraculously though, she agreed. Her voice acting, along with all the other voices, went on to receive critical acclaim. And so, on December 25th, 2010, Danganronpa was released. Sales in the first week were only 20,000. Uh-oh. Thankfully, sales began to quickly pick up as the game largely spread through word of mouth. Various famous creators in Japan began to talk about the game, such as light novel author Ryogo Narita. And as a result, sales ended up at over 100,000. Not bad for a new IP on the PSP of all systems. And crucially, this level of sales was enough to spawn a sequel, and another, and before long, Danganronpa had cemented itself as one of the most well-known and critically acclaimed visual novel series. Hooray! Hi there! So, just like with 999, I thought I'd make a change from the normal type of game I cover on this channel. When I played Danganronpa about a year ago, something about it really captivated me. I hope you enjoyed the video. While I'm typing this, the script is only half done and kind of all over the place. Crossed fingers the final video turned out okay. Bye!